U.S. executives are starting to spend the $940 billion in cash that their companies built up after the credit crisis. That's certainly been seen this quarter, during which takeovers topped $260 billion. That's the highest that we've seen basically since the financial crisis. Leading the charge, AT&T's $39 billion bid for T-Mobile. My next guest is a former Treasury official, Ralph Schlossstein. He's now the president and CEO of Evercore Partners, and his firm advised AT&T on that T-Mobile acquisition. Ralph, thanks a lot for coming in to talk to us. Thank and again, you. Bill Cohen is with us as well. So I want to start more broadly. We'll get to AT&T in just a few minutes. But uh, with the sort of the industry coming back, uh, what do you think the environment is like right now? I mean, I'm curious, and this is sort of a touchy-feely question, but after going through the financial crisis, how do things feel to you right now? How does the M&A environment feel? The M&A environment is feeling uh, stronger every quarter. And if you look over uh, a 30-year period of time, M&A is a secular growth business. And by that, I mean each successive low is higher than the previous low in terms of dollar volume, and each successive high is higher than the previous high. And, but if you look over that 30-plus year period, uh, it's a cyclical business, uh, generally five to eight year up cycles, two to three year down cycles. And we're basically in the second year uh, of what we believe will be a multi-year up cycle. Now, the Bill, well, I'm just going to say, is it, is it being driven, Ralph, by you know, the fact that there is all this cash or the equity prices are high or just because people have been out of practice? It's been three years and we're coming out of the dip and, and the cycle is just starting again. Yeah, I think there are, are a number of factors. Uh, the first is we have uh, very supportive capital markets, stronger equity markets, uh, very generous debt markets. The second thing is that uh, CEOs, uh, rightly or wrongly, feel they have greater visibility about the direction of the economy than they did six months ago or nine months ago when the European crisis was clouding people's judgment about the direction of the economy. Three, you do have that amount of corporate cash, which uh, when it's earning point oh 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 oh. Uh, there are clearly th better things to do by investing in a business. And finally, those three things conspire uh, to uh, create effectively what is the critical ingredient, which is CEO confidence, uh, because CEOs don't deploy large amounts of capital, whether it's equity or cash, without feeling pretty comfortable about the direction of the future. Do you think they're right? I mean, we've seen this, obviously, this big run-up in stocks, people feeling better, but you also have the situation in Japan, which is still uncertain. You have oil prices and the Mideast situation, again, uncertainty there. So do you think that confidence is, is justified right now? Well, I, I think if you look over a longer period of time, you know, three to five years after the, the depths of the economic uh, and financial crisis, that we will generally have a period of relatively slow growth that doesn't do a, you know, an enormous amount to affect our unemployment uh, situation. Whenever you have that, uh, I think you have to worry that the recovery is fragile. Uh, I think we saw last uh, spring and summer uh, when the European debt crisis uh, was at its peak, that that affected uh, the rate of economic activity uh, all over the world. Uh, there are clearly clouds out there, the European debt crisis, uh, unrest in the Middle East, oil prices. Uh, I don't think Japan uh, necessarily is a long-term blip, but those other three uh, could derail uh, the, the speed of recovery that we hope to have this year. So when you look out over the, the M&A landscape for the coming year, I'm curious where the deals are going to be concentrated in terms of, is it going to be more private equity? Is it going to be more strategic acquisitions like AT&T and T-Mobile? Where do you think, who do you think is going to be the most active? Well, the answer is, is both. Uh, strategics will be driven by the fact that, uh, you know, if you scratch any chief executive in America, they will tell you that they would like their top line to grow uh, at single digits and their bottom line to grow in high single digits or low double digits. In an economy that's growing at uh, two to three percent a year in real terms at, with limited inflation, uh, it's hard to get that kind of growth. So uh, 
and corporations have a lot of cash. So the strategics, in order to get the kind of earnings growth that they want to achieve, uh, are looking pretty aggressively at expanding their business and doing acquisitions which involve cost takeouts. The uh, uh, private equity firms are driven, uh, first of all, by the cheapness of debt capital, which is back in a big way. Uh, and second, uh, you have this phenomena in the private equity world where there's a fair amount of capital uh, out there uh, that has a relatively short investment uh, fuse attached to it. And so, you know, that increases the ardor to do business a little bit. All right. So, uh, Ralph, we were talking, obviously, about the bigger M&A environment, but you guys just had a big coup uh, with this advising on AT&T's acquisition uh, of T-Mobile. And Evercore, you know, is, is a firm that has sort of skyrocketed in the rankings of M&A advisors. You were 16th last year, now number nine after this deal. How, how is that happening? How are you guys making that happen? Well, I guess we're on a, a little bit of a mini roll is the way I would describe it. And obviously this is a, uh, a, a cyclical business for firms as well, but we've had quite a first quarter representing ATT and uh, its acquisition of T-Mobile, representing Lubrizol and the sale to Berkshire Hathaway, representing Santa Fe Aventis in the Genzyme transaction, Options Express in the sale to, to Schwab. So uh, here in the U.S. we're actually number three overall, which is not sustainable, but still for uh, even for a, a almost three-month period, it's a nice spot to be. Uh, I think the big trend that we are benefiting from, that we're not the only beneficiary of, is the, uh, the value that corporate executives, CEOs, and boards place on truly independent, conflict-free uh, advice. Uh, I think that has been a growing trend. If you look at the market share of the so-called independent firms or boutiques, in 2000 it was 3%. Uh, last year it was 20%. And, is this a direct consequence of the financial crisis? I think it's a so consequence it's on of a of couple things. Uh, I think it's a, uh, uh, if there were a secret list on Wall Street of all the... Oh, there is, Ralph. No, no, no. <laughs> there are uh, lots of secret sorry, lists, Ralph. Secret list. <laughs> if there is, I want to get my hands on it. But if there is a, were a secret list of all the bankers uh, based on their quality of advice and seniority, that a CEO wanted to talk to when he or she was doing something really important. Uh, there are more of those people in places like Evercore and Lazard and Greenhill and Centerview this year versus last year, and there were more last year versus the year before, and there'll be more in 2012 than in 2011. So, so because bankers like that want to be at these places, uh, sort of to practice their craft free of any right. other Yes. The number one thing is that bankers who really believe in the classical independent advice model want to uh, be centered solely on their clients and not having to sell a range of products from their firm. The second thing that's clearly happening as a result of uh, the financial crisis and, uh, you know, court decisions and, you know, periodic press articles is... Uh, you know, boards and CEOs are realizing uh, that they want to receive truly pure, conflict-free uh, advice. If you look at the decision, the Del Monte decision, uh, the idea of offering advice plus financing uh, is clearly something that, uh, particularly when you look at the relative compensation for the financing versus the advice, uh, at least raises questions in people's minds, actual or perceived, as to what are the interests of the, the bank that's advising them. But you, 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 just, uh, you, you did have J.P. Morgan part of the chase, part of the advisory team, as well as writing a $20 billion check in the AT&T T-Mobile deal. I mean, did that, was, did you see any sort of conflicted advice from what they were giving, or was no, their role... Think, look, I mean, I think J.P. Morgan is a fantastic they firm. They, uh, they watch their uh, business walls. ethics and Chinese walls and conflicts extraordinarily carefully. Uh, but interestingly enough, AT&T had three advisors, J.P. Morgan, Greenhill, and Evercore. And uh, two of those three were independent firms.
So, so why can't the mini role that you're talking about continue with the same kind of momentum? And in other words, what sort of a realistic, um, sustainable ranking for a firm like Evercore? Well, I think that it's it's awful hard. You know, there's six or seven firms that have somewhere between 10 and 30 times the number of bankers that we have. It's hard to imagine that we will consistently figure finish above them uh, in the rankings. Although in 2009 we finished ahead of some of them, and for the, certainly for the first quarter of this year we're ahead of some of them. Well, and you've also as well. pretty much doubled staff, haven't you, in the in the past couple of years? So is yeah. that kind of momentum of hiring going to continue? Well, I think we've been. Uh, Interestingly, uh, while we've continued to grow four to six partners a year, uh, we have been judicious in our growth uh, because we believe very strongly that you build a great firm with A and A plus uh, athletes, and if you don't hire those quality people and they're hard to find, uh, you ultimately dilute uh, the quality and the productivity of your franchise. So while we've grown at that pace each year, uh, our growth is actually, in terms of numbers of people, less than some of the other independent firms. And what about uh, international expansion? I know that's something you've been interested in. What's the future growth plan, plan like there? I, I, you know, I think if you look ahead at M&A over the next five or ten years, uh, the share of M&A that is done globally that involves the U.S. is going down. The share that is done involving Europe is going down, and the share involving Asia, Africa, South America, Australia uh, is going in the other uh, direction. So, you know, our clients, many of whom are large global companies, uh, want to uh, have an advisor who can help them wherever their interests carry them throughout the world. So, we bought a cup. My guest has been Ralph Schlossstein, president and CEO of Evercore Partners, and we're also now joined by Robert Posen, he's chairman emeritus at MFS Investment Management and the author of Too Big to Save, How to Fix the U.S. Financial System. So, Bob, thank you so much for joining the conversation here on Taking Stock. Glad to be with you. So we've been talking a lot about the M&A environment, but I want to turn a little bit to financial reform, which I know you've been active in uh, writing about and talking about. Uh, when you look at the Dodd-Frank legislation and some of the changes that we've seen on Wall Street, have they been significant? I mean, especially when you look at the M&A environment coming back, stocks coming back, prices on many of the asset-backed securities coming back. Has anything really fundamentally changed? Well, I think there have been some serious changes. Uh, I think we have a much better regulatory structure. We have some good regulation of derivatives coming in. And today, just today, we had a very important rule proposal on qualified residential mortgages. In all the 2,400 pages of Dodd-Frank, there's very little to do with the housing market, which, as we know, is really one of the most critical areas. And this, this rule proposal says we're going to have a really tough gold standard. We're going to allow certain sorts of mortgages to be exempted from risk retention and other rules, but they're going to have to get a 20 percent down payment requirement. And, and that's really good because these mortgages in this category are going to be exempt from a lot of things. And I was worried that the requirements would be low and we'd have this anomalous situation where we would have given it, given the sort of federal seal of approval to some mortgages. Uh, but if they weren't really high quality and they defaulted, it would have been a terrible situation. So I, I think this is really an important step forward. Uh, Bob, Bob, this is Bill Cohen. I think that's a very interesting point you make, but I, I have a question. Are you comfortable with the way the rulemaking process is moving forward in the aftermath of Dodd-Frank? I mean, are you comfortable with the input that the industry seems to be having with the regulators in terms of writing these rules and these regulations as they get fomented and formatted? Are you, is that make you comfortable? Does that make you nervous? Is, is Wall Street having too much input into how these rules are being formulated at the moment? Well, I think the basic problem, Bill, is that I think there are literally 240 rulemaking proceedings in Dodd-Frank and maybe another 80 or 90 studies. So everybody, both the regulators and the financial industry, are being a bit overwhelmed 
by how much rulemaking is happening. But given that, I, I believe there's a good dialogue. Uh, the rules today are only proposals. We'll have a lot of back and forth, and presumably uh, the problems will be worked out. Uh, I think this is happening with the CFTC, with the SEC, uh, across the board. You know, there's a very tough balance as a regulator. You want to take input from the financial industry, but you surely want to be in favor of investors and consumers. So, so you got to balance them out. I, I think they're really doing a pretty decent job on that uh, respect. How about Ralph? What do you think? What kind of grade do you give the regulators up until this I, I point? I agree with that. I, I think that uh, the generally the issues tend to be more uh, with legislation than with regulation because the legislative process is a more akin to sausage making. It's not pretty necessarily to watch. And I think the regulatory process generally has draft regulations and comment periods where input is received from consumers and financial institutions. And, you know, I think this administration, quite honestly, has done a quite good job balancing uh, the need for a competitive financial system and uh, the, the most liquid capital markets, which are an enormous asset of this country, and at the same time, putting in much tougher capital standards and consumer protections. Yeah, you know, at the same time, I don't know if anybody saw it because it came out late in the day. Uh, Alan Greenspan actually had an op-ed yeah, in the yeah, Financial yeah. Times where he speaks out against regulation, or at least some of it. He says uh, it's too stringent. It's going to affect competitiveness. Uh, Bob, what do you think here? I mean, I certainly hear a lot of folks on the street anecdotally complaining about uh, stringent regulations, that it's crimping their bottom line or their lives livelihood, et cetera. Well, I think you, you have to distinguish there are many different types of regulation. We have things like higher capital requirements, lower leverage, uh, these new rules on qualified residential mortgages. I think they're going in the right direction. But remember, all the regulators are constrained by that sausage-making process in Congress. And we have a direction to the regulators that they have to do something with the Volcker rule. They have to limit, uh, to a very drastic degree, proprietary trading in bonds. They have to make a somewhat uh, I would say specious distinction between different types of derivatives. So this is not the regulator's fault. This is what came out of Congress. Some really, really uh, hard to understand compromises. And Bob. those are the ones that I think bother people. Bob, we're going to have to leave it there. Bob Posen of MFS, Ralph Schlossstein of Evercore. We'll be right back.